studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning again, Rob. We want to go them low or Queen B? Who, who Whatever you want to call me, Rob. You have the it's Queen great. B t shirt on. Yeah, I do. It should be Queen B. I do. How about the Queen of Lake Thomas? That, that too. That too. Or just Maria. Or just uh, Maria. Yeah. Just Maria. I think Queen B has a certain stigma to it. Stigmas sting, aren't a good thing. Sting to it. Sting. I, I only you got the right sting. word. Sting. <laughs> oh, that was very punny, Bill. All right. Uh, They're going to throw us out of here soon. In studio with us now, Elaine Bartleson and Matt Molinix from the Eastern Panhandle Transit Authority. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having us. Uh, there's a large piece of artwork behind Bill. Bill was up all night painting this. I did. Rendering uh, to make it look as professional as it does. Uh, what are we looking at there, uh, so Elaine and Matt? We are looking at the proposed brand new uh, EPTA, EPTA Multimodal Transit Center project. What does that mean? So we have acquired three federal grants to build a new transit center at the corner of Race and Raleigh. Um, it's just under a four acre lot and it will house a new administration building, a transfer center, a fueling station, a maintenance garage and storage bay, which will finally house all our vehicles inside. Rob's um, going to shoot. Um, the maintenance bay will also house a drive-through bus wash, which is very exciting, mm -hmm. and will reclaim all that water. How big is this grant? Um, totals about $20 million. And how long did it take you to facilitate this grant, get it through the process? So we had three... You can sit it back down. Yeah, there. Okay. we had three separate grant applications. The first one came in 2018. The second one was 2019. And then the third one we just acquired... Um, through a special, it's called RAISE, mm -hmm. and it, it's 100% federal, and that was a $10 million grant. And when does the shovel hit the ground to start this project? So June 26th, right around oh the corner, my. we are going to have our groundbreaking. And why do we need this? Oh, my gosh. Why do we need it? Because we are so far outside of the, our service area, and with the growing population of transit riders and the growing need for commuter service, um, we need this facility downtown. Bill Stubblefield, what do you got for me? Well, I was so busy trying to get this <laughs> framed up. Yeah. Uh, I can go to Maria. You can no, 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 no. Uh, you said you need to be downtown, and I can appreciate and understand it would uh, enhance a little bit. But I thought your location by the airport uh, served you well quite a while what what made the difference why did you feel so, you had to move well first of all that facility was built for 12 vehicles and mm -hmm. about three staff members we currently have 27 vehicles our vehicles are not housed a third of our fleet is housed inside uh, uh, our storage facility um, the problem is two-thirds of our fleet is outside and that affects the useful life of the vehicle the prolonged life of the vehicle it's exposed to the elements the you know the preventative maintenance on the vehicles increases when they're stored outside. So it's very important that we have a facility where all our vehicles can be stored inside because right now the useful life of most vehicles are seven to 12 years yeah. for the government. And what's the growth uh, of number of uh, vehicles you can grow to and still have accommodate them inside? I believe 32. 32, mm -hmm. okay. Depending on the size. Yeah, now do you do all the maintenance yourself? We do. We try to do a majority of the maintenance ourselves. Does that include body work or just mechanical? Um, limited body work, but um, we we use local vendors if mm -hmm. we need a paint job or more extensive body um, work done. But um, I have a great maintenance staff right now, and I would say 80 85% is done in-house. Now, are you funding? How much comes from grants, and how much is self-generated? So I receive about $1.3 million from uh, the FTA. I'm a direct recipient of the Federal Transit Administration for 5307 Operating and Preventative Maintenance Grant. Um, every year, that that dollar amount changes. And then um, the balance is local match um, through our municipalities and my contract revenue. And your total, excuse me, one more question. Your total budget is how much? 2.9 million. Two point, so 1.1 1. 1 is from grants. So you have about 1.3. 1.3, so 1.6 from local. Now, how st static. It's contract. Sorry to cut you yep. off, Commissioner. Nope. Bill, you said just one more question. That's uh, that kind of the second one. Uh, that's these. Uh, the, you remember how you diagram sentences yes. as a kid? And they had all these the little Venn diagrams going yeah. down, and this is uh, one qu one 
line drawn from another line. It's basically one question, Rob. And I forgot <laughs> what it was. And, and I forgot so, what it was. why you need to come to me. <laughs> and, and I tried, because because I was. never get in. <laughs> never get in. Go ahead, Maria. So let, yeah. let me a- answer that real quick. So our local... Well, how, you, you knew the answer. Well, she knew your question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I can read his mind. Yeah. So the, our local municipalities fund us annually. And depending on their budgets determines how they fund us. Um, which generally is under 300000 a year. So the remaining remainder of that local match is acquired by contract revenue um, through our Harpers Ferry uh, National Park contract. We have the drivers and maintenance staff down there, and um, we drive their vehicles. So that. we've been doing that for over 30 years. We also have um, currently Shepherd University, and I'm hoping we stay at Shepherd mm-hmm. University. Um, and we provide uh, shuttle service on campus fall and spring for them, and then our non-emergency medical transportation. Are you in danger of losing the Shepherd contract? Well, you know, higher education is always affected, and every year we hold our breath, hoping. But you know, based on state funding, is what you're saying. Well, and and their their budget too, mm-hmm. which know. is based on state funding. It's based on state funding. Yeah, good, Maria. So, a um, couple of questions. See, I'm predicating it by saying I've got a couple to start. Um, <laughs> When we um, appreciate so, your transparency, so as opposed to some co-hosts who aren't so quite as transparent, I'm going to forget my question. My. Um, so, uh, ribbon cutting the 26th. Yep. What's the time? Gro- groundbreaking. Groundbreaking. Yep. Sorry, sorry. Um, what's the time frame for this type of project? 2 p.m. in the afternoon, 2 to 3:30. How long is it going to take from start to finish to take it? Not the groundbreaking, um, but the project to uh, build. 18 months. We're, a, we're yeah. okay. Be, maybe sooner. I'm going to let Matt speak. Uh, 18 months, we believe, yeah. depending on some certain materials. But yeah, that, that's our hope. And I'm just going to add because one of our funding sources, the last one, which really met our gap because from COVID and the cost, the increased cost of construction, we had a large gap. But the MPO um, was gracious enough to um, put our project up to uh, West Virginia DOT to sponsor it um, every year. Is it every year, Matt? You take this one. Sure. Gonna- <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, one of the one of the the nice results of the federal IIJA bill, uh, the federal surface transportation bill, was a lot of new discretionary grant programs, and some of them have a hundred percent federal share component. And so West Virginia DOT, as an eligible applicant, is always interested in projects that they could submit to US DOT, and this was one of them. So we convinced them uh, the merits of this project. They submitted the grant, and so last June, we were actually awarded the $10.3 million grant, free and clear, no local match, um, all thanks to West Virginia DOT, EPTA, and, and their team. So, yeah. And then talk a little bit about ridership. Um, numbers daily, where they, um, you know, where they come from for the most part, where they're going. So it's a slow rebuild. Um, public transit across the nation is slow, right? Re- rebounding from COVID. Um, this year, our ridership was up 34%. We're still not um, pre-pandemic levels, but the one thing that has changed, the dynamics of our ridership has changed. So many of the riders pre-pandemic um, are no longer around to ride or they've they've moved, right? So we have a whole new generation of riders right now that um, we're working with. And so we're growing this. And I think that's going to be the most important, important part of this project is that all the routes will come into this facility and riders can get off at the transfer station come into the and speak to dispatchers do their business face to face not on the phone bypasses get information um it's going to be it's very important that they have access to our staff have you had a traffic study done how how much traffic is going to be um added to this area so actually not a lot because of how uh, the transit uh, authority operates the bulk of employees and buses aren't coming and going at the same time there's going to be maybe maximum four, four buses around noonish will be coming out 
But the way this is designed is that the passenger traffic or vehicular traffic, personal vehicle, is going to be accessing off race. All the buses are accessing off Raleigh. So we're actually separating by vehicle class mm -hmm. the entrances to the facility. So there will be some new traffic generated, but it's not going to be like building a new commons or something to that effect. Right. And How we, many? And we did do a study, yeah. and it didn't warrant a traffic signal or mm -hmm. anything else. But we, you know, we're in constant contact with DOH. Yeah. How many acres do you have back there? Just under four acres. That's a lot of yeah. a lot of real estate to put on four to put on four acres. So I mean, yeah. So if we could pull the string on the numbers, so the the new admin facility is going to be sixty two hundred square feet. The bus transfer center is going to have six bays, six bus bays for transfers to occur. The maintenance and storage and operations in the back is about twenty five thousand mm -hmm. square feet under roof, and then we have the fueling station under canopy here. So. Um, if I could keep uh, going on what Elaine said about the riders is that, so if you're a rider right now who uses a mobility aid device, if you're a pedestrian, if you're, you don't have a vehicle, you're in a wheelchair, you have a walker, you can't get to Novak Drive. That's five miles south of the urban core. So this is going to prove accessibility for the public to EPTA. In addition to that, Elaine talked about extending the useful life of the buses, of the fleet, which is important, right? Everything, Everything's costing more every, um, these days, but uh, this is going to eliminate what we call deadhead miles. So those are miles that are driven by a vehicle where there's no passenger service, right? So when they finish their runs in Martinsburg, at the VA, in Charlestown, they're deadheading all the way back to Novak Drive. They're adding those miles. They're adding that wear and tear. They're burning that fuel. This is going to have operation savings for, for EPTA when, again, at a time when every dollar and penny counts. Who's what, a, who's a, what, will any of the grant cover salaries? No. So if you have to expand, if you have to generate that revenue yourself, or could that come from another? Well, our, our sorry, our operating grant or the building project grant? Any of the money okay. coming in? Operating grant does cover 50. It's a 50-50 match for operating. So 50% federal, 50% um, local match. And you've done some, um, you know, some interesting, not interesting. Well, yeah, they're interesting. But, um, you know, uh, different kinds of things in terms of advertising inside, outside of the, of the buses. Yep. That's clearly revenue generation revenue as well, generation. right? Yep, correct. So. Who's the contractor for this? For the advertising? No, no, no. Um, for the for the construction, the new. Uh, um, well, so Monday <laughs> our board will vote on that. But okay. currently, right now, we did the bid opening, and low bid was Myers Construction, out of. Uh, Chambers. They're out of uh, Clear Spring, Maryland, I believe. Clear, mm -hmm. That's right, Clear Spring, mm -hmm. and uh, so um, Monday the board um, we will put to the board a recommendation to approve them as the general contractor. Okay. How much clearing of the current land has to occur to accommodate all, these buildings? All of it. Yes, correct. So that uh, an EPTA secured building demo permits, they, uh, the grading permit, once the general contractor is awarded, that's the last piece of the puzzle, and then all the dominoes fall for City of Martinsburg permits to start work. And, and what I'm is your expected date of completion? Uh, September 25. No, uh, whatever the September, October ish. Well, maybe. it's about 18 months of, <laughs> yeah. of contracting. So hopefully early 26, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Um, we'll be back to tell you when we know when we're closer. <laughs> so, we're, so Elaine and I are both lifetime Buffalo Bills fans. So we always want the harshest winner possible <laughs> for our football team. But for this project, we want the mildest winner so the construction season can go as long as possible so we can get it done. <laughs> And working then with the city is sort of the next steps, getting the permits, doing all that kind of stuff. Has it been um, smooth sailing to this to this point? I, I think so. I mean, we have done everything that we can to move the process along. The last step is the contractor. They need to provide some documents before um, the permits can be issued. So we have done all the legwork to date. Um, so. I would assume that the demo would be starting very quickly after our groundbreaking, probably within the month. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Elaine, I mean, they've worked so well with the, the planning commission, city staff, getting the permits. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Elaine's actually worked with the fire department to do training yeah. <laughs> at the old facility. So right now they do, they, they've done some simulation training, they've done some smoke training and things like that. So it, they're breaking it's been... down walls. And... <laughs> yeah. So, which yeah, is great. A... And I, you know, I, that's the best part about this property right now is that I've been able to let 
you know, local municipalities, well, Martinsburg Fire Department um, right now, we've offered them to others, but mm -hmm. um, they've gone in and used this for training. And I was told the other day that the new class of cadets that are coming through were actually in their training. So they were able to knock down some walls and... Um, by the way, if you go in there, the, the precision that these folks have using an axe, I would have thought somebody had cut that with like a steak knife. But they, it, so they're, they're it, impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, how, how is your situation employee wise? We haven't talked to you in a, uh, probably a couple of years, but in regards to attracting and keeping drivers, how is that going? So, you know, it, it's the same old story and I know it's the same everywhere you know they come and they go and um, right now we could use some CDL drivers with passenger endorsement but we are willing to train we can train as well if they come to us with a CDL without the passenger endorsement we will train them um, we have that capability now are you, are you still being affected by some of the places that are around here like Amazon or whatever that are hiring drivers like crazy you know they may leave but they tend to come back too from those areas, mm -hmm. from those facilities. Yeah. And, and your drivers, you're, you're going to sleep in your own bed every day. That's right. Right? Yep. Yeah. When they leave work, they're done till the next shift. Have you been able to increase pay to stay moderately competitive? Um, last year we did. We did have a substantial increase of a dollar an hour. Um, actually, it was just about a year ago we did that. So, um, and we're, lo you know, we're looking, it's all, it's all budget driven. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Now, the goal is always to keep our drivers competitive. Do you have to get legislative permission to incorporate a raise, or is that just simply a matter of making it work in the budget that you get? It's it's a matter of making it work in the budget and the board uh, approving it. Yeah. Are you an independent entity? Do you you get money from the county? You get money probably from the city, but you do not you do not report to either the city or the county, do you? Correct. So yeah. you report to who? Just your board of directors? So my board of directors. Yeah. And then, um, but we do fall under um, the West Virginia Division of uh, Public Transit, which is part of the new multimodal um, corporation under Cindy Butler, who's the commissioner of the multimodal for the state. So we are one of those. So we do fall under, under that. And um, while I don't report directly to Bill Robinson, he is my, you know, that would be who, if I needed anything, I would go to. So you talked about ridership being up 34%, understanding that nobody went anywhere during COVID, what have you. Um, what's the, what, what does that translate to into numbers of riders per day? Um, and I guess that would be different if you add Shepherd in and all those other entities. So but right now our routes are running about 139,000 people annually. Okay. So um, it depends on the day. Ridership mm -hmm. is always higher on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, lower on Tuesday, Thursday. Why? I have no idea. Um, but um, it that's pretty much and it. And do you operate weekends then? What, what so types we, are you doing on the weekends? So Monday through Friday, we operate in Berkeley and Jefferson County. On Saturday, we run two routes between Martinsburg and the VA. You mentioned you also provide under contract to the National Park Service Harpers Ferry. Uh, do those buses come back to Martinsburg? For no. maintenance? They stay in Harpers yeah. Ferry the whole time. Correct. And how about the drivers? Do they stay uh, in that, that area? So um, I have um, specific drivers assigned to Harpers Ferry. But mm -hmm. during the summer months when they ramp up to the, the peak service down there, we do pull drivers from our staff and we hire seasonal drivers for down there. So, you know, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, they run six buses during the peak season down there. So I put six drivers down there. And, and um, so we pull drivers from our, our routes that go down there. I mean, it is a, it's a beautiful place to be driving and they love going down there. It's a change of pace for them. So, um, but then ultimately when the season's over, I just have one, dr two drivers really during the week um, that run the shift. Um, they split it morning and, and late afternoon. And then um, on the weekends, there's two drivers down there, but sure. they have been doing that for um, George Vines, who works for Berkeley County Schools. He's been my weekend driver and he was, he was awarded um, driver of the year last year at the state level yeah. because he has been down there for over 27 years. Good job. So what about contracting with the school system? Um, do you do runs? Do you do anything with Berkeley County Schools or Jefferson no. County? Uh -uh. Not at all. Okay. What's it cost to ride the bus in 2024, Elaine? So if you're staying in Martinsburg, if you are, uh, it's $2 per leg, you know, 
Um, you get off. Every time you get on the bus, you pay or, you know, you have a monthly pass. But if you are a senior citizen or you have a um, half fare card, it becomes a dollar to ride within your zone. What, so, what age is a senior citizen? 60 and up. All of us qualify. Everybody qualifies. Well, everybody, qualifies. Well, Indeed, everybody we went math. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. I've got a 20. And you all can keep the change. Fine everybody. for the room, baby. So, but um, the fares do not, it's $2 to $3.50. Mm-hmm. And you can go from Martinsburg down to Harper's Ferry downtown. Are you still taking cash these days? We still take cash, but we love our mobile app mm-hmm. because it's free. It's just easy. It's easy. I remember when you launched that. Yeah, yeah. it's a great thing. What is that, about seven, eight years now? It's been a while, yeah. yeah. So token transit, it's a great, well, it's a great thing, and people can send tickets. So if you want to get on and send somebody a ticket, you can go to the website, and as long as you have their cell phone number and they've got the app on their phone, you can send them a ticket. So. And another big technological change that uh, Elaine and Epta has done uh, to help increase ridership and information, as we just finished doing, was called the GTFS feed update. So now, if you're on Google Maps, if you're on Apple Maps, you know you click on that transit button, it has all the transit routes, all the times in the Eastern Panhandle. So you can actually use that to get around as well. That and wasn't- And will tell you the fare. Yeah. yeah, and we'll tell you the fare. At yep. one time you were working with senior services. Are mm-hmm. you still, do you still support senior services? So we absolutely do. We both in, in um, you know, Berkeley, Jefferson, Morgan County. Sometimes, you know, when they need help with their vehicles, mm-hmm. we, we offer maintenance help for them when we can. Um, sometimes it's just we can't do it. Um, but yes, we partner with all of them. And, um, and when they need us, we're here. Okay. Official groundbreaking is Wednesday, June 26, between 2 and 3.30. You have some special parking instructions, too, I saw in the we, press release, if you want to go to the opening. Yep. So you should RSV. I do not have that phone number. So, um, Oh, I have oh, it. Oh, oh, you do. Go ahead. Oh, you probably have the, the Gmail, right? The Gmail, if you can. Yeah, I've got the, I don't have the phone number. Oh. I have the events, WVRSVP at gmail.com. Yep. And they uh, will direct you to a parking spot. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Uh, probably... Most folks will be, well, we have parking kind of all over, but probably the senior lot at Martinsburg High School and, and Elaine will, and Epta are running shuttles from all the parking locations to the groundbreaking site. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's one that says 199 R.B. White Avenue. That's another parking spot. That's, <laughs> that's, that's another, that's, that's by the train station. Yeah. So yeah, there's, we have a few spaces. Out. It's, listen, it's going to be, it's going to be an awesome party. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Like it's going to be a great groundbreaking. And there's a lot of folks over the decade that we've worked to get to this point that we want to make sure we're included. So we, we, we'd rather, we rather go big and make sure we got room for everybody than go short and have somebody feel they're left out. How many buildings are involved in the complex? Well, well, four per se, two being open, the fueling station and the transfer station. So four on that. Very good. Well, so, hey, congratulations. Thank you. Can I just say, I, I, you know, without Matt Mullinex and the MPO, um, our agency would not have been able to do this. And, and um, Matt provides funding for all the studies that we've done for this project over the years. And the MPO is a vital organization within our county thank and you, the Matt. Eastern Panhandle. Good stuff. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Elaine, yeah. Matt, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having us. Well, I, and if Elaine wasn't around and didn't have a champion that you could work with, you know, you can have these ideas. Any, you know, these renderings, you, you've probably seen in uh, studies and plans and big ideas have come and gone, have never come into fruition, right? Um, but without Elaine's leadership and everyone at EPTA and their board and our folks from federal and state partners, you know, $20 million, $22 million projects just don't happen, right? right? So um, it takes the, a lot of work. The feeling's mutual. Yeah. Thank you both. Best of luck to you. Thanks for having us. <laughs>